for you guys because I know we all just had lunch and so we're all kind of feeling the post-lunch nap urge. Um, I would like to go nap, but I was told I had to be here anyway. So um, I'll ask you to just hold your questions until the end, hold your napping until the end, and then we can figure it out all later. Um, but today I'm going to be talking about UX or user experience. Um, it was actually very exciting for me to see the program for J and Beyond this weekend because there are actually a lot of user experience related talks. I know Kiara is keynoting about UX also tomorrow. Um, there is a talk about marketing and UX and about A-B testing and all of this kind of ties into the same thing. So when um, looking at this talk, uh, I decided to kind of make it a more foundational approach to UX so that you have all this knowledge that you can take with you to the next sessions. Um, and especially because I think that if you see people talking about user experience a lot um, and see people talking about how you need to do UX and all of that, it can be a little bit intimidating if you don't know what it's about. And as you, if you'd ask 10 different people, you're going to get 10 different answers what UX is. So hopefully I'll clear that confusion um, today. If not, you can yell at me um, during the coffee break later. Also, don't worry about taking notes. Uh, the sessions are recorded, and I will be publishing the slides with my speaker notes later today. So just sit back, relax, pay attention. Um, so my name is Crystal. If you don't know me, um, my Twitter is Crystalenka. That's where I'll be tweeting the slides, by the way. And I'm a user experience consultant. Um, I have Lucid Fox. Uh, which is how I do all of that fun stuff. Um, I worked for one of the largest inbound marketing companies in the world as their only UX architect and helped them shape some of their UX processes for a while. Uh, I also helped restart and briefly led the Joomla UX team last year before passing the torch to Cliff um, so that I could focus on starting my own UX company. And through that, I've also provided um, UX consulting for a product I'm sure all of you know, uh, Akiba Backup, and helped them improve their product. But that's not the interesting stuff. What we're here to talk about is, what is UX? This is a very big question. Um, so it might be easier to just start with what it's not. The words UX and UI are often used interchangeably, but it's not quite accurate. User experience um, and user interface are just not the same thing. I understand how it can get confusing, though. But an interface, broadly speaking, is a point of contact between man and machine, or even two machines where information is exchanged. Um, I have an experiment that I'd like to do. I want all of you to pull out your phones. Come on. I, I actually want you to do this. Um, don't unlock it, just look at the lock screen, wake it up so it's not black or anything, but take a look at it. And I want you to think about if it shows you the time, does it show you notifications, is there other useful stuff on there that you put through customized widgets, um, and does it show you how to unlock it or do you have to swipe it in a certain way or interact with it in a certain way to reveal a pin? Um, that lock screen, on your phone, that thing you use every day is a prime example of a user interface. It gives you information in a succinct, visually pleasing way, and in turn, you could give your lock screen the information that you'd like to unlock it and use the phone. This screen and every single screen that your phone could ever possibly show you has hopefully been laid out by a UI designer. The text, the buttons, notifications, widgets, all of that have been placed with intention. Even colors are selected with care. UX incorporates all of those design considerations and much, much more. If you take a look at that lock screen again, now unlock it. You'll notice that I didn't tell you how to unlock your phone. You just did it, you knew how, um, intuitively. Now, I know that there are going to be some people that say, well, obviously, Crystal, I know how to unlock my phone. I use it, like, all the time, every day. Yeah, okay, so think about when you first got the phone, or 
Think about when you first ever had a smartphone. Did you know how to use it intuitively then? Did you read the manual like only a few people actually do? Or did you just mess around, um, play with it until you figured it out? And how did it make you feel? I realize that that's kind of a weird question to ask, um, how unlocking your phone makes you feel. It probably, right now, it probably made you feel like, Crystal, this is stupid, why are we doing this? But the first time you were using your phone, if you had had trouble with it, or it made you frustrated, or by swiping in one way, it, it did something you didn't expect, that would be an unpleasant experience. The UI is therefore what you do, like that's, that's what you use to interact with the product. But UX is how a person feels or doesn't feel when they're using a product. This is the official definition of UX. It's from the International Standards Organization. And I'd like you to notice how it describes the reaction of your users. It doesn't say a word about design or about pretty things or anything like that. And I'll be honest and say that that's very important, but it's, it's not what UX is. It, it only talks about feelings. And people often get confused about that because of the word UX is used in conversation. I'm guilty of this too. Um, but contrary to popular belief, UX is not a verb. You don't do UX. It's a noun, it's a reaction to how, your, how well your site or your product meets your user's needs. And every user is different. That means that you can never 100% control the UX. A user is going to have a different experience on your product if they were given an award that morning or if they got into a car accident. And you can't control that. So, why am I here? Um, well, the UX is the reaction of the user, and that depends on lots of different factors, which you don't have much control over. There are things that you can do to shape that reaction, and we'll go over that in a little bit. First, though, I just want to talk about why you should care about this. Um, you're still here and listening to me. I don't think anyone's fallen asleep yet, so that's a good sign. Hopefully you know that you should care about UX, or at least you're a little bit curious about it. So that's progress. To answer this question, I would love to talk about how you should care just because it's part of being a good person. If you have a product that people are using daily and in their job, um, the way that your product makes them feel actually affects their lives. If you have a product that's very frustrating for people to use every single day, then they're going to have a terrible time at their job. Um, but it, on the other hand, if you care about UX and you do a good job with it, then they'll, their lives are a little bit better. So it's just the right thing to do. But I realize that we have to get the bills paid and that this is really about business. Um, so I'd also like to say that paying attention to your users and um, doing UX research has a fantastic return on investment. Um, I can give you a quick example from Akiba Backup. Uh, Nicholas said that introducing some UX considerations and doing user testing on his product helped increase sales something by like 20% in one month. Um, and those are very minor changes. You, you might not even have noticed some of the changes that have come across recently, but they, they were small. And there are other benefits too. I mean, if you have an app or an extension um, and you have a good UX, then you'll have fewer support tickets. Uh, you'll get better reviews on websites. A good UX can help you increase the number of conversions and that sort of thing. Um, I could go on more. I mean, the, the benefits of caring about UX are basically limitless. And if you want to learn more, you can just do a quick Google search. There's a lot more than I have time to go over today. But essentially, good UX helps you lower the barrier between you and your users, making everyone's goals easier to accomplish. So now you know why. Let's take a look at how. Crafting a good user experience means working from a good strategy. 
but no two products are the same and no two users are the same. So unfortunately, there's no universal strategy to follow. Um, there are a lot of best practices articles out there that you may have seen floating around. Um, and in most cases, these techniques will maybe work. They don't necessarily have, they're, they're not written with your particular use case in mind. They're written with theirs, and it was effective for them, but you don't know if it's effective for your own. Um, it could actually do more harm than good. So the message here is to do your own research with your own data, uh, which we'll, we'll talk about how in momentarily. Um, but first, I'd also like to note that depending on who you ask, like I said, you'll get a bunch of different ideas about user experience processes and what's the best way. But there's really no best way. It depends on you and your company, your goals, and your users. What's coming up is what works best for me and what I think is a foundation for all other processes, although we might talk about it in different terms. So, how many of you remember the scientific method? Come on. Only a couple? Come on, Didn't you, you took science. This is Europe, I thought it was better, like American education, right? Um, <laughs> well, I'll, uh, there you go. I asked that because UX is really a science, it's not an art. As a result, one of the best ways to approach UX research for at least an existing product or site is with a method suspiciously similar to the scientific method. And I have to be honest, when I learned about this in like elementary science classes, I didn't think I would ever care about it again, and now I'm using it every day. So I'm sure my teachers are very proud of themselves. Um, the goal, just as a refresher of the scientific method, is to identify a cause and ref effect relationship. It's useful in UX because if you can identify what um, causes your users to behave in a certain way, you can make changes that help influence that behavior. So just to go through it really quickly, we start by asking a question or identifying a problem. You have to do some background research, make a hypothesis, create an experiment, and then analyze the results of the experiment. And then you make the conclusion and make changes on your site or extension based on what you did. But regardless of the application, the scientific method does have some requirements in order to work. First, your results need to be measurable. Remember, the point of all of this is to find a cause and effect relationship. You want to know what works best for your users. Some examples of measurable things are bounce rates, exit rates, conversions, sales. Um, a lot of this can be found through Google Analytics, which you can track on your website for free. If you don't have that installed, I highly recommend doing it. It's pretty easy. You just put a little code snippet um, in your template, and you get to track all of this. If you have an app or extension, you can measure things through user testing, like how long people take to complete tasks and other things like that. Second, you need to have a fair test. A fair test is where you change only one thing and everything else stays the same. This is extremely important because if you change a whole bunch of things at once, then you're not gonna know what caused your users to behave differently and you might implement the wrong thing. It's also really good if you have a control, basically one set of data or one part of the experiment where you didn't change anything at all um, to see that, to make sure that your results weren't a fluke. And third, if any of you watch Mythbusters, it's not science if you don't write it down. Keep track of what you're doing, what you're testing, why, and if you can keep the information, you can reference it later for future testing or compare it with later results. And once you're ready to meet all of those requirements, then we can get started. So the first step was to ask a question and identify a problem. So if the results need to be measurable and you have to construct a fair test, um, you gotta have a good question. So some examples would be, how do we decrease, decrease the bounce rate on our homepage from 75%? What color buttons are people more likely to click on? And why aren't people reading the freaking manual and how do we fix that? And that's only a couple examples, 
Um, the questions you have will be, it'll depend entirely on the problems that you face. Once you know what you're trying to find out, uh, you need to do some background research. There are two main things that you care, care about here, your business goals and your user goals. The business goals should be the easy part. I mean, you have a business plan and goals and a reason for improving the user experience, right? What is your goal? Do you want to increase revenue? Do you want to increase impressions on an ad? Uh, attract new members to an online community? Your goals depend on you. Um, but each of these would have a very different UX strategy. And if you have multiple goals, you can rank them by importance. Finding out your user goals is a little bit trickier and really the bulk of user experience. Before you know your users' goals, you gotta know your users. It's predictably the most important thing in user experience. And there are a lot of tools that UX professionals use to help do our user research. Um, all of these and more basically build into personas. You can look up more information about these different parts of it, but this is one of the most important things. Personas are semi-fictional characters based on real users. They exist to put a face on your research because it's really easy when you're working with a lot of numbers to forget that the people using your extension or your website are real people. They have lives, they have backgrounds, they have reasons for what they're doing. Um, UX deals with feelings and reactions, so it's important to remember all of that. Personas answer at a minimum what the user needs, what they want, what their habits are. Most businesses or organizations have somewhere between three and five, um, divided by characteristics like goals, motivations, whatever makes sense for you. And you might be thinking, I have something like this for marketing, or I know who my users are, I can put a profile together. And that's a great starting point. Um, but you're not done. You have to keep in mind what you're assuming and, and what comes from actual data. Take the information that you already have on your audience and make sure that you mark which ones are coming from assumptions. At some point, it would be a really good idea to validate those assumptions so you know you're not just making things up as you go along. Uh, and if you don't have any information yet, you have to collect it. This is where stakeholder interviews, user interviews, things like that that were on the previous screen um, come into play. I'm sorry, it's on a different screen. <laughs> uh, so stakeholder interviews basically are interviews with people at your company or invested in your product who may have certain assumptions about the people using your product. User interviews are with the people who are already using your extension or your website or they're considering using it. And you need to find out what are or were their goals by actually getting out there and talking to them. And once you have this information, you can create a persona. I could talk for hours on how to create a proper persona, how to make sure your information will help you shape your decisions. But I have a lot more to get through today, so I am totally cheating and linking to a resource. Um, this is not something that I created. It's from a site called UX Lady because she got the domain before I did. Um, but it's a very valuable resource. It's her do-it-yourself guide to personas. She has a template. She has very detailed information on how to put each, together each of the sections and why it's valuable. So I highly recommend that you check it out. Once you've done your research, you have your personas, you know what your goals are, we go back to the scientific method and start to form a hypothesis. If you remember, we're doing this to find a cause and effect relationship between your website and your users. So the easiest way to do that is with the classic if-then statement. For example, if I oversleep, then I'm gonna be late. Or, if George commits code, then everything breaks. <laughs> I, I love you, George. Don't choke me. Um, on a more serious note, it helps if you reference the question that you had right at the beginning of the process. 
So one of the examples that I gave you was what color buttons are people more likely to click on? So that becomes, if buy now is a contrasting color, then people are gonna convert more. And this gives you a good base to then test your hypothesis. There are many ways to do that. My example is pretty straightforward. We would just be testing what color button converts better. Now, if you have the technical ability to do A-B testing, that would be best in this scenario. And just briefly, A-B testing is where the traffic going to your website is segmented, and each a uh, segment of traffic is presented with a slightly different version of the same page. And I think that tomorrow Mike Demopoulos is gonna be talking more about A-B testing, so I'm just going to leave it at that. And if you want to know more, you can attend. Um, but depending on your hypothesis, you may need to use other methods of testing. Moderated testing is where someone uh, sits with your users and watches them go through a task, the screen's recorded, basically everything's recorded, and the advantage of moderated testing is that there's a person there that can ask them, okay, why are you doing this? Why are you clicking on that button when the thing you're trying to do is like way over there? Um, unmoderated testing is where basically you could use an online service uh, that gives your gives an example user a prompt and their screen is recorded and they're clicking through this is less labor intensive than moderated testing tends to be a little bit less expensive um, or their surveys you know there, there's a few other things that you can do um, and there are services available to help you with any of these and some of them will even help you craft the test I also can help with this sort of thing through LucidFox so if you have questions you can come and find me later and I'd be happy to talk with you more about it but remember, your results need to be measurable, you have to have a fair test, and you gotta write it down. So if you don't meet these requirements, then your results probably won't mean very much. But after you've completed the test, either by yourself or um, with someone's help, then you get to analyze the results. The kind of results that you get depends on your users, how the test was designed, what you were testing, so it's hard for me to get more into this section. Um, but I guarantee that once you're going through the information and talking to people, you'll, something will jump out at you and be like, oh, that's so obvious, why didn't I think of that before? And after that, we're done, right? Right? No. We're not done. You're never done. Remember the scientific method? That little bit right there that says repeat is necessary, it's always necessary. That's the benefit of using a process like this. You can make small but surprisingly impactful changes um, a little at a time and improve your product or site over time. Um, there are other benefits to doing that too. For example, a lot of users don't like to deal with major changes at once because it's disorienting. Um, muscle memory is a big thing if someone is used to clicking on a button in a certain place and you suddenly move that button to somewhere else, they're going to be clicking on the wrong, but wrong button like all the time. And they'll be mad, so don't do that. But. Um, it can be hard sometimes to know where to start. So if you're looking for inspiration, you go to UX, UX best practices? No, um, because you can't blindly start applying some of this stuff. Remember, it's, it's, these articles are written with their own use cases in mind, and it doesn't necessarily apply to you. If you think that some ideas you find will apply, then you can test them. But instead, I find it a lot more useful to do user testing. Just start with a user. Um, pick a common task or two and ask someone to try and complete that on your site or extension. Um, it can be basically anyone in this case. It doesn't necessarily have to be a persona. If it's a little bit more technical, you're gonna have to probably find a little bit more technical user. But for websites, it's it doesn't matter so much. There's um, a random person running through your site, even for 10 to 15 minutes will be completely eye-opening, and I'm sure you'll get inspiration on how to run your own tests. Um, UserBob is a very inexpensive service that finds random anonymous users for you, 
and lets them run through your site. User testing does something similar, but it's a more grander subscription-based model, so it's a little bit more expensive. Or you can do it yourself. Rocket Surgery Made Easy by Steve Krug is a fantastic read. Um, some of you have probably read his other book, Don't Make Me Think. So this is the continuation of that and how to get started. But yeah, I mean, after that, that you just keep improving your site, improving your extension, and uh, I think you'll be happy with the results. And that's really all I have time for today. Um, I don't think I have time for questions because we got to get to the next session, but if you have questions, feel free to come up to me. I'll be around all weekend. Okay, thank you.